this is actually a refilming of a film I made the other day and I ended up running out of space on my phone so I ended up deleting some things off it to make more space uh, but I forgot to actually take off the films I wanted first so I lost a little bit and I can't remember what I talked about. Uh, I think it was basically to show that I've now bolted down the front half of the frame and in the end I did just decide to go with flush mounted hex bolts uh, mainly because modifying coach bolts would be a possibility uh, I just don't like the idea of a fastener where you can't get to one side of it because over time the, the chances of those getting stuck in there are pretty high um, there were suggestions of modifying uh, coach type bolts putting a slot in them so you could you could get to them in the future but one of the problems there is I don't believe you can actually get um, BSF coach bolts, or at least I haven't found any that I can get easily. So the bolts I've got in there at the moment are just um, metric M8 as temporary placeholders. I'm going to replace those with 5 sixteenths. And I only needed to um, recess the ones that basically go underneath the doors. So the rest of them are all just on top of the the chassis, uh, the frame rails, you can sort of see them down there, which is good because it means I can then arrange some of the other brackets to be held down with the same bolts. Um, so now that I've got those in place, I should be able to start making the the doors. Now the the bottom piece of the door uh, that should be straightforward enough, and the the front and the back of the door should be straightforward enough, but the the piece that goes along here is going to be interesting. So this piece will be straightforward, that's just almost a straight piece uh, with a little bit of shape on the side to allow for the curve of the body, but this one is going to be really interesting to make because it's curved in every direction. So that'll be interesting, and also of course the two sides of the doors uh, off the car aren't the same the door is shorter on the passenger side the actual curvature i need isn't too bad to work that out because i've got this original one to copy so that gives me the right shape but physically shaping the timber is going to be an interesting exercise uh, what else did i mention before i did order some neoprene washers which are going to go underneath the frame uh, so they are three millimeters thick so around an eighth of an inch thick uh, where my measuring wasn't the best just in around here the way the the chassis rails bend isn't exactly uniform so I may need a couple of washers just in a couple of places there and the idea of those is to lift the timber off the metal so that there's actually an air gap so that you don't get um, things getting caught in there and having it all rot out. Uh, it'll also give a little bit of flexibility to the mountings, but that's not so much of a problem because the wood itself is fairly flexible. The Now that this is all bolted down and actually attached to the car, I can start thinking about how I'm going to do the firewall. And for that, I need to take into account the fact that there needs to be a, a step there so that the bonnet panels fl flush. And my thinking at the moment is um, the skin will go over this and be hammered around. So it's got a layer of aluminium all the way around. The firewall will then bolt onto that. I may need to make some little brackets or something. But the firewall will also be um, covered in aluminium that will come up flush. So firewall will be plywood. And it actually comes down sort of in here. It's flat across here, curves around, and then comes down. And then there's aluminium that sort of covers the front of it, comes out in a little shelf, and then comes down to somewhere around here. Not sure exactly where. but uh, And that's where the actual metal firewall is. You can see the starter gear is actually sticking into the passenger footwell, so that's something to be aware of. And the there is actually aluminium that covers 
the outside of the timber here as well. So that comes up and around and just sits along the edge there so you can still get to those. I will plug these with something um, when the time comes but that's easy enough. And I will start considering how I'm making all the little metal bits of bracketry that go in there. And what I want to do is use the brackets that, that strengthen all of this to also be what the hinges bolt to. So the hinges won't be just bolted to the timber. They won't be screwed into the timber. I'm going to bolt them all the way through and use countersunk, um, countersunk bolts with, with nuts on the end to make everything nice and secure. Uh, the only other thing I did, I think I mentioned this, is I gave the car a really good clean. So I actually keep dust cloths on it now. I have been wiping it down with a rag. Um, I'm actually getting a more suitable container for the rag. But in there I've just got a microfiber cloth. And I'm just using WD-40 just in a spray bottle. And I just sort of wet the cloth with that. And I've been rubbing everything down with that just to try and get it to look a bit cleaner again because it was it was really getting filthy. Uh, but that seems to work quite well and it, it just keeps everything clean. One interesting thing is a lot of these nuts and bolts are just plain steel so they'll rust really quickly. Uh, I think that's original. Obviously if you're restoring a modern car most of the fasteners will be um, plated or zinc passivated or something like that. But I think back in the day they were just steel, so apparently they would rust. Uh, it'd be interesting to know if that is actually the case on, a, on an original car or not. So my plan is just to keep wiping it down, keep it nice and clean that way, and keep the dust cloths on it now. Uh, I think I previously mentioned the piping, the top pipe's in, I'm still waiting for the bottom one. That will finish that off. Uh, and. I've already filmed the next piece, but that's to do with a little kit set, a little circuit that I built up to help figure out the when the points are open or closed in the magneto, just to help set the timing. I've gone through, I've checked all of that, and that is correct. So it's looking much cleaner than it did, having been wiped down. Uh, and the other thing I should maybe start thinking about doing um, is once I've drilled all of the holes I need in the chassis then I can look at painting it. So there are still quite a few things to go. I need to make the hoops that go over the axle. They work kind of as rebound straps uh, to stop the axle coming too high up. So I need to make those out of some metal strap. There will be other brackets and bits and pieces. I'm hoping to reuse these mounting bolts here to make up the cradle uh, that will hold the fuel tank. The fuel tanks on these are round, so it's a circular tank. That's actually original. This is a saloon car tank, and you can see that it's just a cylinder soldered together. So the tank will go in there. Uh, it still allows some access to the boot. And I need to look at the battery mounting. So I believe there are two diagonal pieces of steel that go one in there, one across there. And one of those, the battery sits on top of that in that place. Uh, there have been some interesting posts on the Riley Register Forum recently around other things, fuel pumps and bits and pieces. But there's a couple of pictures in there showing a starter solenoid uh, I, I did wonder where that was mounted, but it looks like there is another bracket that sits on here and the starter solenoid sits up here, which is quite quite neat and tidy. One of the things I want to consider is how I can build the car so that the body can be taken off it without needing to disconnect too many things. So it would be good if I can run the main starter cables and things actually in the chassis so that they're not attached to the body, so you can lift the body off. Uh, the mechanical connections can all be undone from the back of the gauges and things like that. And for the electrical connections, I think what I'll do is use modern connectors, but they'll be hidden up inside here, inside the body, so you won't see them. 
but at least that means uh, the body can easily be unbolted and removed if you ever need to do any work on the car. The back, now that I've got that all nicely smoothed off, I can start thinking about how the seat back fits in there, what actually holds that in place. I have seen cars where there's a wooden, sort of a wooden strip that gets bolted to that cross member, um, and that I think provides a sort of slot for the the seat back to fit into. The seat back is one piece. Uh, it's not two separate pieces, so it's one panel that sort of fits in there. The other thing I'm going to have to consider, and I might need to talk to my certifier about, is the seat belts. It will need lap belts, and they will have to be mounted down in there somewhere as well. So I need to make sure there's room for that. Uh, what else did we do? I did just put some paint, I might need to do a bit more, um, just on the temperature meter, just so that, that doesn't all rust again. And I do need to remake, make a decent starting handle. Um, I think that's more or less where I was at on this. So tonight, after work, I've been playing with a little circuit uh, called a growler, which goes across the contact breaker points and lets you know very easily when the points are open or closed uh, because it makes a noise. And this little circuit, I found the details for this online. It was a, an Australian site, I believe to do with motorcycles. And it was a little article about how you can modify a, a J-Car electronic kit set. Uh, it's called a He Haw Siren. And the article explains how you can modify this circuit to turn it into a, a magneto indicating circuit. Uh, the article is a little bit confusing because obviously they, they, they wrote it up originally and then at some point J-Car changed the circuit board. So the instructions now have a muddle of old circuit board, new circuit board, and it could be a little bit hard to follow. Um, this electronic kit is only really available in Australia and New Zealand, so it's not going to be much use to most people. But the article does include the circuit diagram, and I actually worked it out from the circuit diagram in the end to make sure I had it correct. Uh, but it works very well. So it's just a little speaker, and when the points are opened or closed, you sort of have this across the points. And all that is doing is telling me when the points are open. Um, and the point at which your points open is when you get your spark. So what I'm able to do is turn the engine over on my crank handle. Uh, I really need to make a better crank handle. And I've got my timing marks down there. I have to use a mirror to be able to see them, but I've actually written the, uh, the degrees on the flywheel. I measured it and wrote them on there in white paint. If I was clever, I guess I would have written them in reverse, so they made sense in the mirror. But what I can do is Figure out where top dead center is. It's a bit hard with one hand. That's so top dead center. If I set it to five degrees advance, you can see as I rotate the advanced retard lever on the points. So that direction is full retard and you can see I've got it set just to go back a little bit. So the firing is right near top dead center. So that little circuit actually works really well. Um, I've just always found doing this or setting this rather tricky, rather complicated by trying to look at it and figure out what the points are doing and where it's pointing and that kind of thing. Uh, with the circuit now it makes it dead simple and 
I can basically see that I've got it pretty close. Um, I may actually want to set it back just a little bit, just a fraction. Um, I don't imagine I'll ever really be starting this car on the handle. If you start it on the handle, you really want the ignition timing to be retarded so that it's definitely firing when the piston is on the way down. Otherwise, if the piston's still coming up and you're cranking it by hand and the spark fires before it's at the top, uh, the engine can run in reverse and it'll kick back on the handle and you can break your arm or your, your kneecaps or something. So, it's pretty close. Uh, now that I've, I've made this little circuit, I'll put all the details in the description so people can find the links. Um, I'll put it into a little box, which will make it uh, much more useful with a little uh, switch on it. But I think this now is a much, much better way of knowing when the points are open or closed and for me to be able to set the the timing. Uh, static timing on this engine is um, at zero degrees, number one cylinder, top dead center. So right on upright, basically. Uh, yeah, it works really well. If people do want to build their own version of the circuit, the, the article has all the, the details there. It's very simple. It's a 555 timer and a couple of transistors. Um, you know, and a few other discrete components, so there's not a lot to it. Uh, the only reason I didn't build it myself on a piece of Vera board is it was easy enough to get the kit and build it from that. It's been a long time since I've actually built a, a little electronics kit like that. Um, my background is computers, really, that's what I do. I do software. But I was always interested in electronics and got into that at an early age, so I basically paid my way through university doing, uh, working as an electronics technician in the holidays and things. And when I went to the UK after finishing university, I didn't have enough computer science experience, but I had a ton of electronics assembly experience. So I actually got a job doing um, as an electronics technician. So the electronics has always served me really well. It's sort of been a hobby and I wouldn't say a career, but it's been jobs um, for most of my life so I find doing things like that quite fun and quite rewarding.